In at 5, Devil. Released in 2010, Devil is a supernatural horror film about 5 strangers that get trapped inside of an elevator, everyone's worst nightmare, and one by one the passengers begin to be killed off in a gruesome manner when the elevator lights periodically flicker on and off, revealing the fate of the next victim. Now going back to the first moments of the film, we're greeted by a voiceover. How the devil will sometimes seek individuals out who have sinned, taking human form and trapping them in confined places, turning others against Against them before killing everyone one by one. Brutal. Later on in the film, we meet a security guard, Detective Bowden, a recovering alcoholic who, who explains that his life took a downward turn after his wife and son were killed in a hit and run five years prior. The perp was never caught. Back in the elevator, one man is killed after being thrown into a mirror by an unknown force, slicing his jugular vein. An old woman is hanged by a lamp cord from the elevator ceiling, another man's neck is twisted, and a girl's throat is slit, leaving one remaining passenger. Tony. But things aren't great for him, as the corpse of the old woman seemingly comes back to life, revealing herself as the devil and stating that she has come for Tony. It is then that Tony confesses to being responsible for a hit and run that happened, you guessed it, five years ago. The devil becomes powerless now that Tony has repented and eventually vanishes. The elevator comes back to life and Tony is free. Detective Bowden takes Tony into custody and while en route, he informs Tony that it was his wife and child that he had killed five years prior and that that he forgives him. How sweet. In at 4, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Released in 2005, The Exorcism of Emily Rose is a supernatural horror film based loosely on the Annalise McHale case. It follows a defense counselor played by Laura Linney, an agnostic representing a parish priest, accused of negligent homicide after an exorcism. Emily Rose is a 19 year old student that died of self inflicted wounds and malnutrition due to the exorcism. Throughout the film and trial, we are shown flashbacks of her life leading up to her final moments alive. It shows Emily suffering from visions and physical physical contortions, but doctors diagnose her with epilepsy and psychosis. She leaves school and returns home to her family, but her symptoms worsen, even smelling burnt toast, which, as previously stated in the film, is a well-known supernatural phenomena. During the exorcism, Emily attacks, breaking free from her restraints and fleeing out the window towards the family barn. They chase after her, continuing the exorcism, demanding to know what demons are inside of her. It is revealed to be six demons, including Lucifer himself. During the film's final flashback to Emily, we find out that on the day after her exorcism, she was visited by the Virgin Mary, who offered her a choice, ascend to heaven or become a martyr and prove the existence of God and demons. Emily chose the latter. It's a bittersweet film and knowing that it's loosely based on a true story is even more heart-wrenching. In at 3, The Conjuring 2. Now, a lot of you may be surprised that I didn't opt for the first Conjuring film, but in my opinion, the second movie is far more effective in delivering a possession story. Plus, it's loosely based on the Enfield Haunting, which is a classic for us Brits. As most of us will know, The Conjuring 2 once again follows Ed and Lorraine Warren, but this time to the UK, as they investigate the paranormal occurrences plaguing the Hodgson family. One of the Hodgson children, Janet, is haunted by an angry elderly man who keeps on insisting that the house is his, eventually possessing Janet. We discover that his name is Bill Wilkins, a man that lived and died in the house. However, we were all duped by this. Bill was never the true baddie of the film. He was just a pawn being manipulated by a demonic force. Valak, aka the nun. During the final standoff between Lorraine and the demon, Lorraine banishes it back to hell by addressing it by name, thus freeing Janet from its grasp. In it too, The Possession of Hannah Grace. Due to be released on November 30th of this year, The Possession of Hannah Grace follows a former policewoman who becomes tormented by the supernatural while working in a morgue. The body of a young woman who died during an exorcism is brought in, and this is where things seemingly take a dark and terrifying turn. Hannah Grace, the dead girl, awakens and begins to to torment the former police officer, hunting her through the dark halls of the quiet morgue. Take a look. What are your thoughts? Are you going to check out The Possession of Hannah Grace at the end of the month? Leave us all your thoughts in the comments down below. And finally, in at number one, The Exorcist. Because, of course, we can't possibly do a possession list without including arguably the most famous film of them all, The Exorcist. This 1973 supernatural horror tells the story of Reagan McNeil, a 12 year old girl living with her actress mother Chris in a beautiful home in Georgetown. However, after Reagan plays with a Ouija board and contacts an imaginary friend called Captain Howdy, things take a dark turn. 
Reagan begins to act strangely, interrupting her mother's parties by peeing on the floor and even walking down the stairs backwards on her hands and feet. Not only that, but she also begins using obscene language and exhibiting ridiculous amounts of strength. Nexicism is recommended and Father Damien Karras along with Father Merrin perform it. During this, we witness the young girl impale herself with a crucifix, rotate her head 360 degrees, even vomit green slime over Merrin, who eventually dies of a heart attack during the exorcism. Karis, being the girl's last hope, invites the demon to enter him instead, and once it does, Karis throws himself out of the window in a moment of self sacrifice, destroying the demon's vessel and saving Reagan all at the same time. Coming in at number 5, we have Clara Jermaine Selly. Back in 1906, Clara was a young South African. African Christian who was said to have been possessed by a demon at the age of just 16 years old. Clara was a student at St. Michael's Mission in Natal, South Africa during this time, and it was at the age of 16 that she was said to have made a pact with Satan, which resulted in demonic possession, supposedly. In an account written by a nun, it was said that Clara could speak many languages, languages that she wasn't capable of speaking prior to her possession. She was also reported to exhibit clairvoyance, with her revealing secrets and transgressions of people she had never met. It was also reported that Clara could not be in the presence of holy or blessed objects, a classic sign of possession. And when she was, she would seem to exhibit extraordinary strength and ferocity. A nun even stated that Clara would make peculiar sounds, stating, I quote, No animal ever made such sounds, neither the lions of East Africa nor the angry bulls. At times it sounded like a veritable herd of wild beasts orchestrated by Satan and formed a hellish choir. Two priests went on to perform an exorcism on Clara, with it lasting approximately two days. During the exorcism, it was said that Clara knocked the Bible out of the priest's hands and even attempted to choke him. By the end of those two days, it was said that the demon was expelled from the girl and that she was healed. Happy days. Before we jump into number four, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. It really helps us out a lot in the YouTube algorithm. Coming in at number four, we have Anna Eklund. Anna Eklund is actually a pseudonym for Emma Schmidt, a woman who was allegedly possessed by a demon, with exorcisms occurring over several decades, resulting in one extensive exorcism that took place between August 18th to December 23rd of 1928. Schmidt was born in Switzerland and was raised in a Catholic household in Wisconsin, and on June 18th of 1912, she underwent her first exorcism. After exhibiting signs of possession, including revulsion of holy objects, disturbed thoughts, and inability to enter churches. Now, despite the first exorcism taking place, it appeared to be unsuccessful, with the second exorcism being performed in 1928, with Eklund being moved to a convent after once again exhibiting strange symptoms, including fits of rage, and the inability to be near blessed objects. The second exorcism was reported to be incredibly violent, with Eklund even levitating and howling during it. The first session lasted until August 26th, with the second session occurring between September 13th to September 20th, followed by a final eight-day session that lasted from December 15th to December 23rd. Eklund's body began to deteriorate during this time due to lack of food and constant vomiting. On December 23rd, Father Rising had commanded the demons out of Eklund and seemingly cured her of her possession. Coming in at number three, we have Michael Taylor. Born in 1944, Michael Taylor was a man from the UK who became notable after he alleged that he was possessed by a demon. Taylor reported feeling evil inside of himself, even verbally lashing out during a Christian fellowship group. His behaviour continued to become more erratic, with a local vicar turning to other ministers to call out the demon that was supposedly living inside of Taylor. An exorcism took place between October 5th to 6th, with the ministers believing that after an all-night session they had cast the demons out of Taylor. However, they did state that three remained, insanity, murder, and violence. However, Taylor was allowed to go home. When he did return home, though, he brutally murdered his wife and he was found by local police naked in the street and covered in his own blood. At his trial, Taylor was acquitted on grounds of insanity and was sent to Broadmere Hospital for two years before being sent to a secure ward in Bradford, before ultimately being released. Jumping forward to 2005, Taylor was once again in the news after touching someone inappropriately, resulting in him once again being ordered in psychiatric treatment. It seems less like the devil and more like a deranged human being who should not be allowed to live amongst society. 
my opinion, that is. Coming in at number two, we have Annalise Michelle. Annalise, often referred to simply as Anna, was a German woman who was said to have undergone roughly 67 Catholic exorcisms during the year prior to her death. When Anna was 16 years old, she began to experience seizures and was ultimately diagnosed with psychosis caused by temporal lobe epilepsy. Not long after that, she was diagnosed with depression and was treated at a hospital. However, by the time Anna turned 18, she began to exhibit violent tendencies. She began hearing voices and was intolerant of religious objects that were around her family's home. Her condition continued to worsen, resulting in a family believing that she was possessed by a demon. The family ultimately turned to the Catholic Church for help with priests being approved to conduct a series of exorcisms on the girl, with the family halting any communication with doctors altogether. During the ordeal, Anna began to stop eating and ultimately passed away from malnourishment and dehydration following 67 gruelling exorcism sessions. The girl's parents and the two Roman Catholic priests were found guilty of negligent homicide and spent six months in prison for their crimes. There are many popular horror movies that took inspiration from this case, including The Exorcism of Emily Rose, as well as Annalise The Exorcist Tapes. And finally, in at number one, we have Roland Doe. Now, this case claims our number one spot, and rightfully so, with this true possession case being the story to inspire the movie The Exorcist. Back in the late 40s, a young boy dubbed Roland Doe was alleged to be possessed by a demonic entity, with priests from the Roman Catholic Church performing a series of exorcisms to attempt to expel the demons residing within. Roland Doe was said to be a German Lutheran, with him and his family residing in Cottage City in Maryland. However, according to reports, on one particular occasion, his spiritual aunt allowed him to play with a Ouija board, which may have resulted in his supposed possession. According to reports following the death of Roland Doe's aunt, the family began to experience strange goings on within the home. Noises, furniture moving on its own accord, and ordinary objects levitating. The family ultimately turned to their pastor, Miles Schultz, with him arranging for Roland Doe to spend a night in its home to monitor the boy. Schultz claimed to witness those same goings on within his home when the boy was there. An exorcism was arranged, with documents from that exorcism stating how the boy slipped his hand loose from his restraints and managed to break a bedspring from under his mattress, using it as a weapon to attack the priests. During another exorcism on the boy, it was reported that words such as evil and hell appeared on Roland Doe's body, with the mattress beginning to shake during the ritual. Despite the terrifying goings on after the rite was over, it was said that Roland Doe went on to lead a rather ordinary life. However, like I said, this case shocked the world after William Peter Blatty chose to use elements from the events in his novel, The Exorcist, back in 1971, with the famous story going on to be one of the most successful and famous movies of all time. Coming in at number five, we've got Elizabeth Knapp. Granted, around the time of the Salem witch trials, a lot of things may have been interpreted as demonic or paranormal when they shouldn't have been. Just take a look at all of the people accused of witchcraft for patently non-witchy things and you'll see what I'm saying. If someone weighed the same as a duck, that means she's also made of wood. And people burn wood, but people also burn witches, right? I'm getting away from the topic at hand, sorry. 20 years before the start of the Salem witch trials, there was a young woman working for Samuel Willard, a somewhat prominent reverend in Massachusetts. That girl was named Elizabeth Knapp, and she may have been possessed by a demon. A little odd, considering the holy nature of the man she worked for, but that's how the story goes. One October, Elizabeth started to complain of pains all throughout her body, ones that couldn't really be explained. As time went on, these pains increased in frequency and and intensity, so she went to the reverend. She told him that she would often convulse uncontrollably and had many fits of screaming and crying for no apparent reason. It even felt like she was being strangled by an unknown, unseeable force. Needless to say, these behaviors concerned the reverend. Eventually, Elizabeth told the reverend that her ailments all began when she made a deal with the devil. Classic. She somehow got in touch with this underworld overlord and exchanged her soul for eternal youth and exorbitant sums of money. Once these admissions were made, things got much worse. Elizabeth would speak in a terrifying, distorted voice, and it often appeared that the devil was speaking through her. Her body would contort in such violent and grotesque ways that it took multiple people to hold her down. In addition to all of that, her throat also swole up like a balloon, which couldn't have been very comfortable. Unfortunately, nobody really knows what happened to this poor young lad. 
class. In the Reverend's journals, all sorts of demonic experiences were detailed, but he eventually conceded that he wasn't quite sure what to do with the girl. He didn't know what exactly was happening to her, but he could tell that the things going on weren't voluntary. Whatever demonic presence had overtaken Elizabeth Knapp was determined to stick around and prevent anyone else from ruining its fun. Coming in at number four, we've got Bobby Jindal. Most of the time, American politicians don't have too many dealings with the devil. Well, not publicly anyways, it would ruin their reputation. However, this former governor of Louisiana says he found himself face to face with a demon and even wrote an article about his experience. That's gutsy for sure, especially for a guy who would eventually run for public office and win. Well, it sort of came back and bit him in the ass because he likely could have run for vice president alongside Mitt Romney. And looking back, it becomes increasingly apparent that his dealings with demons put a big hole in his VP aspirations. But enough political talk, let's get to the demon. In his article titled Beating a Demon, Physical Dimensions of Spiritual Warfare, published in the New Oxford Review, Jindal describes his attempts to exercise a demon from his pal Susan. Poor, poor Susan. Apparently, the undergraduate was undergoing treatment for her cancer at the time, and some of the effects made Jindal suspect there might be a demon present. He and a bunch of other Christian college students banded together to perform an impromptu exorcism. They had contacted a preacher to preside over the proceedings, but this holy man told them to hold off on the exorcism. In his article, Jindal questions whether the preacher simply did not want to come over to a college dorm, or if he was worried about the demon potentially being too powerful. In the end, the group of students went through with it, holding Susan Susan down as best they could as she struggled and attempted to escape. Eventually, a student from a rival Christian college organization burst in with a crucifix, and this seemed to work on the demon. When they read Bible verses aloud, Susan screamed profanities and questioned the value of the religion. However, in between these supposedly demonic outbursts, Susan also showed her true face, begging to be rescued from her possessor. In the end, the demon was said to be removed, and Susan was able to return to life as normal. However, Jindal's eventual political aspirations would be cut short thanks to this demonic possession. One has to wonder what would possess him to write his experiences so plainly. <laughs> Coming in at number three, we've got Michael Taylor. This case is a peculiar one indeed. Back in the 70s, Michael Taylor was working as a butcher in West Yorkshire. He and his wife had recently joined a Christian fellowship group, which Taylor took very seriously. A little too seriously, perhaps, as he soon began engaging in what his wife describes as carnal relations with the leader of the fellowship group. Mary Robinson. This didn't sit well with his wife, so she called it out in front of the rest of the group's members. Most people would probably yell something rude and profane and then slink away in embarrassment, but Michael Taylor? He claimed that he'd been feeling evil inside of him and got really mad at Robinson. After this, he requested an absolution but continued to act strangely. This behavior encouraged a local vicar to seek out external help, so he brought in a couple of ministers to assist with an exorcism. This demonic expulsion went on overnight and supposedly removed over 40 demons from Taylor. However, they didn't get them all. The ministers said that three demons still remained inside. Insanity, murder, and violence. You can probably see where this is going. After this all-night affair, Michael Taylor returned home. During his time there, he ended his wife's life and strangled their pet dog. He was found wandering the streets in a daze covered in blood. Adultery, insanity, then violence. Those must have been some serious demons. Either that or Taylor just wanted out of his marriage, but couldn't think of a better way to go about it. Coming in at number two, we've got George Lukens. Not to be confused with George Lucas. Of all the times one could get possessed by a demon, you would think that a Christmas pageant would be pretty low on the list. You know, celebrating the birth of the holiest of holy figures and all. But poor George Lukens, he couldn't catch a break. He'd been performing at his local pageant and seemed to fall over for no reason. According to Lukens, it wasn't too much eggnog that did it. It was a supernatural force that slapped him, knocking him to the ground. In the following years, Lukens developed a seemingly incurable condition that doctors couldn't explain. He could though, and he said that it was demons. Multiple presences attempting to take over his body. When doctors gave up on curing him, a priest stepped in. He performed an exorcism on Lukens, which became quite the public event. Folks from all over came to see how it was going, and many reported a very disturbing scene, including Lukens claiming that he was the devil, becoming violent, and even barking like a dog. 
After all this though, Lukens seemed to be cured. The priest said that he sent the demons back to hell and that Lukens was a god-loving person once more. And finally at number one, we've got Clara Germana Selly. If nuns are getting tossed around like rag dolls, it's time to investigate what's going on. And this is exactly the case when it comes to this South African possession. 16-year-old Clara Germana Selly had supposedly made a pact with the devil and used her newfound abilities for evil. She made animalistic noises that chilled the bones of all who could hear them and gained supernatural strength. At one point, she even levitated off the ground, only to be brought back by splashes of holy water. Folks aren't exactly sure why she made this deal, but when a 16-year-old starts throwing nuns across the room, you don't try to get to the root of the problem, you try to stop it immediately. The exorcism was a grueling two-day ordeal in which Clara attempted to suffocate the priest multiple times. She spoke languages she couldn't possibly have been familiar with and projected a terrifying demonic voice. Eventually, the demon was exorcised, but nobody involved would ever be the same again. So, making deals with devils doesn't seem so sweet now, does it? 